Hi, welcome to Your Great Journey. Each week we offer you brief tips, techniques, and insights to help you move in positive directions and master big change. For more information, please visit yourgreatjourney.com. Your Great Journey is brought to you by audiobook publisher Wetware Media. Wetware Media publishes a wide variety of personal transformation audiobooks available from any major online audiobook retailer. For more information, please visit wetwaremedia.com. That's W E T W A R E M E D I A.com. Today, we're sharing an excerpt from the audiobook Rewire Your Anxious Brain How to Use the Neuroscience of Fear to End Anxiety, Panic, and Worry. Written by Catherine Pittman, Ph.D., and Elizabeth Carl. This audiobook is a unique evidence based solution to overcoming anxiety based in cutting edge neuroscience and research. You'll learn how anxiety is created in the brain, as well as the techniques you need to overcome it. Your brain is a powerful tool, and the more you focus on changing the way you respond to fear, the more resilient you'll become. In this excerpt, Dr. Pittman and Ms. Carl provide an understanding of the amygdala and anxiety. Like the conductor of an orchestra, the amygdala controls many different reactions in both your brain and your body. They explain the role of the amygdala in creating anxiety in the brain. This understanding is an important step in learning to change your brain and overcome anxiety. Chapter 2. The Root of Anxiety. Understanding the Amygdala. Don't be fooled by the small size of your amygdala. Even though the largest and most developed portion of the human brain, the cortex, contributes to anxiety in many ways, the amygdala plays the most influential role because, as you learned in Chapter 1, it's involved in both the cortex pathway and the amygdala pathway to anxiety. Like the conductor of an orchestra, the amygdala controls many different reactions in both your brain and your body. In addition to relying on pre-programmed responses, it's also exquisitely sensitive to what happens to you and responds to your specific experiences. In this chapter, you'll learn about the amygdala's special language and its impact on your life. In evolutionary terms, the amygdala is an extremely ancient structure, and the human amygdala is quite similar to the amygdalas found in all other animals. Because the human amygdala is so similar to that in rats, dogs, and even fish, researchers have been able to study its functioning in depth and have learned a great deal about how it creates fear and anxiety. When you're born, your amygdala has pre-programmed responses that are ready to be put into action. But this ancient structure isn't fixed. The amygdala is constantly learning and changing based on your day-to-day -day experiences. In fact, once you understand what we call the language of the amygdala, you'll have more control over your anxiety responses because you'll know how to influence the part of the brain that's at the very root of fear. The amygdala as protector. To understand amygdala-based anxiety, it's useful to think of the amygdala as your protector. Natural selection has given humans a fear-producing amygdala that has protection as a central goal. As you go about your day, the amygdala is vigilant for anything that might indicate potential harm. While the goal of protection is good, the amygdala can overreact, creating a fear response in situations that aren't really dangerous. Consider Fran, who's about to give a speech. Her heart begins to pound, and she starts to hyperventilate as soon as she stands in front of the group with everyone staring at her. What is her amygdala trying to protect her from? It seems as if it sees the situation of standing in front of an audience as dangerous. Fran is not alone in experiencing this type of response. Studies have shown that fear of public speaking is the most commonly reported fear, surpassing fear of flying, fear of spiders, fear of heights, and fear of tightly enclosed spaces. What could account for this common response? Because the amygdala tries to prevent us from being prey to a predator, Evolutionary scientists have suggested 
that we may be prone to interpreting eyes watching us as a potentially dangerous situation. Others have suggested that the risk of rejection by a group of observers comes from an ancient fear of being rejected by one's clan, which once meant being left on your own to fend for yourself and face roaming predators, a likely death sentence. In any case, it appears that the human amygdala reacts to protect us from being in the vulnerable situation of being observed by potentially hostile animals, including other humans. Fran may not be aware of the evolutionary roots of her reaction and the amygdala's role in it. Her cortex may be telling her that she's afraid of being criticized, humiliated, or making a mistake, while her amygdala is operating from a more prehistoric perspective. The truth is, the cortex often comes up with reasons for our behaviors, which may or may not be accurate explanations. However, the concern here isn't the accuracy of the cortex, but its effects. The more Fran dwells on cortex-generated explanations for her amygdala-based anxiety, such as, you're worried that your boss will never be satisfied with this presentation, the more cortex-based anxiety she'll create, adding to her problem. Looking in the cortex for the causes of amygdala-based anxiety is like looking in your refrigerator to understand why your car won't start. You aren't looking in the right place. Instead, Fran needs to focus on her amygdala's perspective. She needs to see that her amygdala is trying to protect her. Instead of using her cortex to seek explanations for her anxiety, she needs to use her cortex to apply her knowledge of the language of the amygdala. First, she needs to recognize that her pounding heart and increased rate of breathing, which would help her if she needed to run or fight, don't indicate that she's truly in danger. These responses are part of the amygdala's reaction, and they aren't helpful in the context of public speaking. Fran needs to understand that this isn't a dangerous situation and that her amygdala is setting off an alarm unnecessarily. Even if the speech Fran is about to give is very important, perhaps for her career, it's unlikely that this is the life-or-death situation that her amygdala seems to be preparing her for. This underscores the importance of being aware of the amygdala's role as protector. This is crucial in understanding and controlling your own anxiety responses. In many cases, the amygdala's assumption that you need to be protected from danger is incorrect. Fortunately, you can remedy this by retraining your amygdala and by not giving the amygdala more fuel for the fire by assuming that a fearful or anxious emotional reaction is a definite indication of danger. The protective amygdala reaction is often misguided, and you don't want to let your cortex strengthen the reaction. Lastly, it's important to recognize that simply trying to use your cortex to convince yourself that the situation isn't truly dangerous won't always shut off the amygdala's response. A more effective approach is using deep breathing techniques and strategies that retrain the amygdala, and we'll outline this approach in Part 2 of the book, Taking Control of Your Amygdala-Based Anxiety. How the Amygdala Decides What's Dangerous the human amygdala seems predisposed to respond to some stimuli as if they're dangerous. Fears of snakes, insects, animals, heights, angry facial expressions, and contamination seem to be biologically wired into the amygdala because humans learn them with very little prompting. For example, few children have a car phobia, but many are afraid of insects. Although cars pose a much greater danger to children than insects, the fear of insects seems to be hardwired into the amygdala such that children develop this fear very easily. This is undoubtedly the result of thousands of years of evolution in which a fear of insects contributed in some way to survival. However, even fears that are programmed into the amygdala can be changed. If they couldn't, it's unlikely that so many of us would live with sharp-toothed animals like cats or dogs and treat them as part of our families. On the other hand, many objects or situations aren't naturally feared by the amygdala. Instead, the amygdala learns to fear them as a result of life experiences. The amygdala is constantly learning based on experience, and after certain negative experiences, it creates brain circuits that cause people to fear a previously unfeared object. For example, a child doesn't naturally fear a flame and must be warned not to touch it. But after a child is burned by, say, a birthday candle, 
the child's amygdala learns to fear the sight of flames. In addition, the amygdala quickly adds various flaming objects to its list of dangerous things to avoid, so the child may also fear lighters, sparklers, and campfires. The amygdala retains lasting memories that identify the object and similar objects as dangerous. This is a very powerful and adaptive ability because it allows for the creation of specialized neural circuitry that helps people avoid the specific dangers that occur in their lives. This has kept the amygdala useful and virtually unchanged for millions of years. When we explain the two pathways to anxiety to people, they often ask if they could have inherited a sensitive amygdala. Genetics can definitely influence the amygdala and therefore your typical emotional reactions. For example, children who have a smaller left amygdala tend to have more anxiety difficulties than other children. The good news is, every amygdala is capable of learning and changing, and in later chapters you'll learn how to train your amygdala to respond differently. Emotional Memories As discussed in Chapter 1, the amygdala forms memories, but not in the way people typically think about memories. On the basis of your experiences, your amygdala creates emotional memories, both positive and negative, that you don't necessarily have an awareness of. Positive emotional memories, such as the association of the smell of perfume with feelings of love for your partner, usually don't cause much difficulty. Therefore, we'll focus on negative emotional memories, especially those that result in fear and anxiety, because these memories can cause a great deal of amygdala-based anxiety. As noted in Chapter 1, the lateral nucleus of your amygdala creates emotional memories based on your experiences, and these memories can lead you to respond to certain objects or situations as if they're dangerous. Because of these memories, you're conscious of a feeling of discomfort, fear, or dread. However, you don't realize that this feeling is due to an emotional memory because the memory isn't stored as an image or verbal information. It isn't like an old photograph or movie in your mind, as cortex-based memories can be. Instead, you experience an amygdala-based memory directly, as an emotional state. You simply begin feeling a specific emotion. If this feeling is anxiety, it's easy to assume that having a fearful or anxious feeling is an accurate reflection of the dangerousness of a situation if you don't understand the language of the amygdala. Consider Sam who was in a car accident that severely injured his girlfriend who was driving. To this day, when he rides in the passenger seat of a car, Sam has anxiety, an urgent feeling of danger that seems to result from the current situation in his environment. Sam doesn't experience a memory of the accident or reflect on the accident every time he experiences this amygdala-based anxiety. However, any time he approaches the passenger seat, he has a strong feeling that he must avoid the situation and he becomes extremely uncomfortable and almost panicky whenever he tries to ride with another driver. If he tries to put his feelings into words, he says it feels like something bad is going to happen if he rides in the passenger seat. He's more comfortable driving himself, and for years he's avoided being a passenger. Because his deeply felt emotional reaction is so real and persistent, he doesn't consider whether he should question it. He would never describe it as a memory formed by his amygdala, and he doesn't expect himself to change it or even realize that he can. Thanks for listening to this excerpt from the audiobook Rewire Your Anxious Brain, How to Use the Neuroscience of Fear to End Anxiety, Panic, and Worry. You can purchase the complete audiobook from any major online audiobook retailer. If you'd like more information, please visit yourgreatjourney.com. Please be sure to subscribe to the show so you don't miss an episode. And if you like the show, please rate and review it. And please, share it with friends who might also enjoy the show. Thanks for listening. Your Great Journey is brought to you by audiobook publisher Wetware Media. Wetware Media publishes a wide variety of personal transformation audiobooks available from any major online audiobook retailer. For more information, please visit wetwaremedia.com. That's W-E-T-W-A-R-E-M-E-D-I-A dot com.